Inside this video right here, I'm gonna share with you every single thing I know about patient assessment. Make sure to stay tuned to the end of this video. I'm gonna give you three bonus tips. Here we go. Hey everyone, it's the paramedic coach here and this is my ultimate patient assessment video. You're gonna love this one. If you're new here, hit subscribe down below and tap that notification bell and smash annihilate that like button for the YouTube algorithm so more students around the world can see this content and understand patient assessment because the stakes are so high in EMS. Here we go. First thing we have here, this is going to be our secondary assessment, our main assessment that we do on an awake patient who's stable and we're going through our secondary assessment. Now, the primary assessment we know is about finding life threats, your airway, your breathing, circulation, all that. This is our head to toe detailed physical exam and I'm going to be sharing things I've never shared here before on this channel. Now here we go. First thing we know is this patient. We start with the head, right? My rule number one is you got to take the hat off the patient every time. Let's say this was an altered mental and as I remove the hat, there's a large hematoma right here. There's unequal pupils with altered mentation, high blood pressure. That can be a head injury, right? So the first rule, you got to expose your patient. I'm going to say it again. You got to expose your patient. Now, what am I looking for? Well, when you go out in the, in the real world, there can be medical calls with trauma calls. For example, what if you're driving, have a stroke, or driving, have a heart attack, you're a trauma victim, and you're a medical patient. So when I'm doing my assessment, I'm not thinking medical or trauma, I'm thinking everything. But I want to put in the screen right here the mnemonic of DCAT BTLS, because it's very important. Now here it is. Deformities, contusions, abrasions, penetrations, or punctures, BTLS. Burns, tenderness, lacerations, and swelling. You need to be able to say it like I just did there, you know, have it down cold. So I start with the head. I'm looking for any DCAT BTLS here. I'm looking here on the ears. Anything coming out of the ears? Any fluid coming out of the ears? I have my pen light. I'm going to say, look here. Okay. Okay. I'm looking for the size of the pupil. Are they reacting to the light? Is it constricted or dilated? Then here's my quick tip. This is one of my first big tips here. It's called the vertical nystagmus. What we're going to do is we're going to have the patient look up here. So here's your light. Okay, look up here. Here we go. Here we go. And if you see a fluttering of the eye, that's vertical nystagmus. I check that every patient every time because if we have a sneaky stroke in the back of their head, a cerebellar stroke, we can get that nystagmus. So you want to watch out for that. If you do these little things, and I have other things along the assessment, stay tuned. I'm going to show you all these little tactics. If you do this every patient, every time, when you have a patient and you need to do it, you do it without thinking about it, which is good. It means you won't miss anything. Now, moving on from there, check the nose, any nasal flaring, anything like that, and then the, the airway. So, you know, we go to the patient, they have you go, ah, you know, for the time, how do my patient do that? Checking for any blood or vomit. Now, I'm going to go to the neck. I'm going to get this going here, like this. And I'm going to start listening to sounds. So, I'm going to go, okay, give me a deep breath. In and out. I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna go about about over here. About over here, and get my first set of sounds. But there's more to talk about with the neck and the chest. Here we go. So we're moving on here to the chest and the neck. What am I looking for first? I'm gonna peek back here. I'm gonna expose my patient as we're moving towards the chest. And what I'm gonna do here, I'll show you, is now I can see what's going on with my patient with the chest. Okay, moving on to the neck, I'm gonna take two fingers, I'm gonna go back here, and I'm gonna feel the back of the cervical spine. Now, when I feel that spine, I'm looking for pain or tenderness on the spine point. If I have pain out here on the side, that's more muscle, I'm gonna note it, but I'm not as worried about it, okay? From here, I can have the patient, I can look here, I can look here for any sort of JVD going on, okay? I already got my tracheal sounds, are they clear? Do I hear anything, you know, that I shouldn't be hearing? Um, now from here, when I get to the chest, 
I have my lung sounds. I showed you that already. Now what we're looking at here in the chest is for equal rise and fall. Is it equal or unequal? Is there any accessory muscle use from the neck? See, I want to expose right here so I can see that whether there's accessory muscle use here in the clavicles, you see? So that's what I want to do, expose that patient to see that. Now, after I've gone to the chest, what lung sounds do I get? That's so important. So let's go through them real quick. Here it is. If I get a patient with lung sounds, for example, clear, that means good. If I get rails we're think on both sides, we're thinking about a patient, bilateral rails, CHF patient, okay? If I get rails on one side only, that could be an early onset pneumonia. If I get ronchi on both sides or on one side, I'm thinking about pneumonia. If I get wheezing, here's a mnemonic right here, our second little message board over here is going to be AAC. So asthma, anaphylaxis, COPD, that is what wheezes. So here, wheeze, think that. Hey, what about strider up here in the neck? Well, strider you can hear across the room, but just in case, if you had to listen and you heard it, okay, what's strider? Well, there's five things a strider probably going to be. Croup, epiglottitis, usually more pediatrics. Okay, that makes sense. Now, what about the other ones? Burns, foreign body airway, anaphylaxis. So you got to look out for those, whether it's a scenario in class or it's out in the field. But wow, we've gotten a lot of info so far just from going from head to chest. Now the abdomen, the pelvis, the hips, legs, let's keep going. Now here is my quick tip with the abdomen. I'm going to feel the abdomen. I want to make sure it's soft, it's not hard, not distended or rigid. There's no, there's no guarding or anything like that. The patient isn't flinching or anything like that. I'm going to feel the hips and the pelvis. Now, with the, everyone watching this video right now, I'd like you to do this. Take two fingers, put it on your belly button. Take two more fingers, put it on your anterior right hip, the front of your right hip, okay? Now, two-thirds towards the right hip, push down and out, and then push down, and then let go. That's McBurney's point. It's right about here on our patient. Now, McBurney's point, I'll put a picture of it right here, as you can see what it looks like. McBurney's point is going to be how we check for appendicitis, okay? So let's go through our, our quadrants real quick to remember. Slice them up. Now, here we go. So I'll do it on me and do it on, on our friend here. Right, that's going to be liver gallbladder, okay? That, that hangs out there. Left, okay, there's two S's and a P. Stomach, spleen, pancreas, just slips in there, okay? Now, what about lower right? That's your appendicitis land, okay? Obviously, there's intestine in there as well. Now, what's the main player on the left side? You see someone going like this most of the time? Diverticulitis. The sigmoid colon right there is diverticulitis land, okay? So watch out for that. Now, the flanks, think kidneys. When I say retroperitoneal, think of the kidneys. Retro means behind, so the kidneys. Big tip here with the abdomen. Stay tuned for the bonus tip. We're going to talk about the chest, the abdomen. I got more on that. But let's continue for now. I roll down the legs, looking for DCAT, BTLS with the legs, very important there. Now with the legs, I have pulse, motor, and sensory as well. So sensory, can you feel? Motor, you gotta move. Pulse, top of the foot, side of the foot. We have a great pulse here. Quick tip, I'm gonna go off subject, but I wanna give you this one. There's a pulse point right here. You can feel. This is where you put the head of the scope when you're doing a blood pressure. If you put the scope in the wrong spot on your blood pressure, see it's right here, it's right here, okay? Right here. You can feel a strong pulse there. That's gonna be for your blood pressure, okay? Now obviously if your patient doesn't have a good blood pressure, it might not feel it, okay? But you know what I'm saying? Good. Now something very important here with the leg exam my friends, please hear me on this one. This is one of the most important tips. If you have a patient with difficulty breathing, you need to check their legs. From now on, if someone tells you they can't breathe, you gotta check their legs. Why? Edema in the legs means they have a CHF issue. If they have one leg that's swollen and painful, it could be a DVT into a PE. If you don't document that, and this patient here has CHF or PE, you don't treat them, you're gonna get burned. And not only that, even worse, the patient is gonna suffer. And I will say it one more time. 
Every single patient with difficulty breathing, check their legs. The legs help you with the lungs. There's two L's. After all that, you got to remember it, okay? So important. Scan your arms, okay, equal grips. Feel me here, feel me here, pulse, great. Now what we're going to do is go to the back. Remember with the neck, we did, we did the feeling the spine, same deal. Go down that spine, let the patient know. If there's pain in the sides, okay. I'm looking for pain on the midline of the spine. So go down that, baby, and see what you get and document it, okay? Now that ain't our head or toe, but I have three bonus tips for you. Hang with me. Here they are. Everybody, you've made it to the bonus. Congrats. If you did, smash the like button down below and give me the hashtag bonus fam down below. You made it. So comment down below or give me that hashtag down below that you made it to the bonus section. Congrats to you. I got three tips for you. Number one is this. You got to expose your patient. Now, here's why. You do not want to go to the ER with a patient with an injury that on the abdomen or the back of the chest that you missed because you didn't expose your patient well enough. So I'm gonna explain to you right now in a role play scenario how I best go about this without barking orders and making your patient comfortable. Now I'm gonna use my name as the patient's name. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna put a timer up here. Three, two, one, here we go. Okay, Evan, I hear you out. You're having some chest pain right now and some abdominal pain. We gotta do a few things here. As we're loading you into the ambulance, once we get you in there, what we're gonna do is just pop your jacket off pop your hoodie off, and we're gonna take that and put it right in the back of the stretcher, okay? It's gonna go with you into the ER, so don't worry about that. Now, we need to do an EKG. I'm gonna put some stickers in your chest, and then we're gonna do also some vitals. So just a blood pressure, get your heart rate, stuff like that. My partner's gonna come around and get a blood pressure while I'm doing the EKG. Then we're gonna take it from there and get going to the hospital, okay? That's how you do it, okay? Now, the second thing is the chest. When I have the patient's chest, and I'm getting my lung sounds. I do not care what some random guy on your ambulance corp or some random guy your fire department says about having a good scope. You need to get the best scope possible for you. If that means you need to buy a Lippmann scope, please go ahead and do that. Okay, here's why. When you're out in the streets, when you have a diesel you know, engine going, it can be hard to hear sometimes. But here's the thing, guys. You cannot give meds to a patient when their lung sounds because rails and wheezing is two different things. So here's what I want you to do. Never be ashamed to tell everybody on scene to be quiet, shut up, so you can get some lung sounds. I, I might sound brash. It's tr the truth because you cannot do your job without getting lung sounds. So if it takes you a full minute to get them, it's okay but you need to get them to be able to treat this patient at the best level possible. So do your best and due diligence with that. Never guess or think you heard something. Never that. Number three. And number three here is the abdomen. I wanna talk about medical and trauma. There's two tips. How many tips? Two tips. One medical, one trauma with the abdomen. If you go to a patient with a distended abdomen and it's hard and rigid and you're out of trauma, could be blood. I had a medical and the skin is hot. Could be septic from one of our players in the abdomen exploding into the abdomen, its contents. So for example, that's what happens with appendicitis. The appendix has all that infection and then it bursts its contents into the abdomen that gets into the lining of the abdomen and they become septic, hard, rigid, distended. So that's why they had the surgery to rid of it before that happens. You see? Okay, remember, appendicitis starts around here with the pain around the belly button, then later it gets painful here. So if somebody has pain here and appendicitis, it's late. Remember that. Now, with that trauma patient with the abdominal issue is this, the spleen. Anyone gets hit in the left chest, left flank, left upper quadrant, think spleen, why? If I have a bad spleen injury and you know it's bleeding, it's really bad, I can get referred pain up here to the left shoulder. It's called curse sign. Don't forget that. That's a real gem. You have somebody with trauma, ah, oh, my shoulder is killing me, but you didn't get hit in the shoulder. It's a spleen issue. There it is.
My friends, I have a very important message for you. Congrats on getting to this point in the video. If you are one of these three people, if you are somebody right now who's getting ready for EMT, advanced EMT or paramedic school, and you want to use a secret weapon, you want to use something that will get you ahead of school and make school so much more easier for you, and not just school, help you better prepare for the road when you're actually taking care of patients, or you're somebody right now who's in school and you see how accelerated the schooling is and you need extra help, or you are somebody right now studying for national registry exams, whether it's EMT, advanced EMT, or paramedic, click the link in the description down below. It's prepareforems.com. It's my life's work. It's 180 plus videos, plus access to me as your coach in our community group to ask me whatever you want. Now, what you get access to is all that. The course takes you all the way from someone who's a pre-EMT all the way to paramedic. This is what I give to people for national registry prep. This is what I give to people who are struggling in school. This is what I give to people who are getting ready for school. There are different sections inside of those 180 videos that break up those three types of people. My friends, I cannot recommend this enough. If you want to give yourself a safety net against you struggling in school, take action and watch the videos. The link's in the description. I hope you learned so much today about patient assessment. Now let me serve you at a higher level. My friends, I'll see you there. Catch you in the next video. Take care. Waste, don't waste any time. Don't, don't be hesitant and just do it because I know this program works. And I know it's, it got me to where I was, where it's been a year without school from EMT to, hey, I passed my test in 70 questions. Like, go for it. You could do it. Like, do not hesitate and don't waste any time. People that don't know you, they need, to, they need this program. This program is not a, a choice. To me, this program is a habit.